So here we have a story by Ronald D. Moore, directed by David Livingstone. Yeah, I rather like this one. You can tell it's more. This time I swear I'm actually right about that, because he keeps calling back to little things in the past, like the usage of the quickening, for example. Just little details there. Uh, there's some behind-the-scenes stuff I'd like to talk about here, but I kind of want to save that for later. So rather than talking about that now, let's just go ahead and move forward. Although, as I've actually already mentioned, once again... We have both Kreetek and Naval, both of whom have been in Star Trek before and are now being played by different actors. Maybe Romulans just really, really like cosmetic surgery. You know, it's funny, as I looked for a little bit of an explanation, and there was even an uh, AOL chat transcript which brought this up briefly, but it, there was no answer. It was just, eh, okay. In the beginning of the episode, we see one of the big problems with triage. See, the problem with triage is the whole point is to take care of the critical stuff first and not... Yeah, I mean, you know, acknowledge the things that are acceptable to lose, although I've actually heard uh, people debate that over the years. But the point here is if you kind of say, well, you're critical and you're not, and you focus on the critical, then a new th critical thing happens, and a new critical thing happens, well, what's going to happen to the non-critical thing? <laughs> Funnily enough, real-life time management actually follows the exact same general principle. You can't always focus on the critical thing, because if you do, the non-critical things will just continue to never be addressed. Which, in addition to not being cool, can lead to some pretty big problems later on. <laughs> There's this nice bit where Bashir says, he's talking to Garak, and Garak's like, I hope you're going to go, and you know, I hope Starfleet Intelligence is taking advantage of the situation. And Bashir's response is, why would we spy on our ally? That made me laugh. But then I realized that that's actually been something that's been debated for... Uh, millennia? Yeah, yeah, I think millennia is a good answer for that one. That, this, that is something, excuse me, that has been debated for an extremely long time, whether or not you should continue to maintain spy elements on your allies. Now, you obviously should on your enemies, not just for the obvious military reasons, but, well, as weird as this may sound, for the purposes of de-escalation and preventing war. I know that sounds like a strange thing, but, I mean, we have a modern example of that, for God's sakes, with the Cold War. No. Spying on the Allies, though, you should never do that. It's wrong. I don't agree. I think that maintaining a proper surveillance network on basically everyone is probably something that should be done. I could go into my reasons, but again, this is a debate topic, not a, you know, this is correct or incorrect kind of a thing. So, as usual, I'm kind of curious of your guys' thoughts. It doesn't surprise me that the Federation wouldn't be sending an overt thing to this, because the Federation... Well, first of all, Starfleet Intelligence kind of sucks, other than Section 31, obviously. But another thing, funnily enough, very recently, uh, an episode went live from my perspective, uh, my rumination on Redemption Part 1 over in TNG, and I made a really big stink about the fact that the Federation was unwilling to lend military assistance to a military ally who has been their ally for a long time and is specifically reaching out to them seeking said military assistance. Now, I actually read a lot of, in comments about a lot of people who disagreed with me on that, which is awesome, because I love, you know, disagreements as long as they don't go into the point of screeching or rage. But one of the interesting points is a lot of people brought up some nice counterpoints. You know, there's other ways to interact other than by simply sending out ships to fight. Like spying, for example. If, for example, the Federation had been regularly spying on the Klingon Empire at the time, they would be able to be like, So, Garon, we have all this intel on you and yours, and we think this kind of leads towards the, the Romulan influence, and this is what's going there, and he, he, they could just share all that with Garon. Boom! Advantage Garon. And us helping our ally in a non-combat non way. So, yeah, no. <laughs> I am definitely on side of the... Uh, should spy on allies concept. So Sloan shows up. Hope you're well rested. Ha ha ha. Uh, there's this bit where Bashir says he could have security down here in 30 seconds. I find that questionable. I know Odo runs a tight ship, but 30 seconds? That's pretty impressive, especially at all hours of the night. There's this nice bit where Sloan says that Bashir will work for him. It's in his nature. Then he spins some story about how Bashir likes secrets. 
But what I love about that is his first sentence is absolutely accurate, but we'll get more into that later. So, there's this nice bit. Again, there's a lot of nice bits in this episode. I'm sorry, I keep prefacing my sentence with that. I'm just kind of running through the episode because there's a lot of really great moments, like when Bashir goes to Cisco and is like, hey, and Cisco says, yes, I brought this up for Starfleet Command, but the investigation hasn't gone anywhere, which means someone at Starfleet Command is protecting Section 31. And my first reaction was, uh, yeah, Starfleet Command is. I mean, this is the Omega part of pr protocol all over again, isn't it? People at a certain level are let in on the know, and they then to continue to maintain the, st the circumstance. I don't want to say status quo, but, you know, they are on board at that point. I assure you, all of the upper admirals are aware of Section 31 and approve of it one way or the other. It's kind of probably part of the thing you have to do to become part of Starfleet Command or become the CNC or whatever. <laughs> So, <clears throat> moving forward, it's like, okay, hey, Ross tries some Romulan ale. It's really hard in his throat. You know, for the longest time, I didn't understand why people would cough when they have really harsh alcohol. And then I tried, uh, I think it was vodka for the first time, and it hit my throat, and I just immediately started coughing. <clears throat> whiskey does the same thing. Actually, not whiskey, sorry, bourbon. Bourbon, I get too confused. Bourbon does the same thing to me. It's like, it's like swallowing fire. Uh, Sadler. William Sadler plays Sloan, of course. I know that's kind of old news, but I bring it up because it really, once again, shows how someone like him is so essential for a role like this. The man does an awesome job of playing multiple different roles in this episode, including the, the nice, light, little, happy, hey, yes, I'm, I'm just kind of a Starfleet geek, and I just wanted to have a word with you. Is there anything we could talk about? You know, just, of course, you have to have a talented actor, to play a talented actor, and it's another reason why Sadler was such a perfect choice for this role. Thankfully, not the last time we'll see him, by the way. So, we uh, we see a brief insight into Romulan politics. I have the weird feeling Moore would have liked to dig more into the Romulan society and people. It's just, the Romulans never really came into the fore. In fact, they kind of never do, if you actually think about it in Star Trek. Every time the Romulans show up, we see peaks little peeks into them, and then we go back. It's not like the Klingons, which we fully divest, or the Ferengi, or the Bajorans, or the Cardassians, or something that's not on Deep Space Nine. You know, <clears throat> Vulcans, there you go. No, no, no. We just see little hints of the Romulans. And it's a damn shame, but we get an insight into another little thing. The Continuing Committee, which was actually invented for this episode, and has never mentioned before or since. But even with the way it's mentioned, it gets across an interesting idea. You've got the Senate, which is, of course, in charge, and, you know, the consul, proconsul, praetor. But we also get across the idea that there is a, I hate to say an executive branch, but that's kind of what it feels like. Like, amongst everything else, there's also the executive board that handles that kind of thing, rather than the more legislative uh, approach of the Senate, right? And we get the idea that there's a reason it contains people from multiple avenues. They actually flat out mentioned that senators Tal Shiar and a member of the Tal Shiar are usually part of this, thus the inference that this is probably composed of people from all over the place. I wouldn't be surprised if the military directly had a seat on that, uh, the executive committee as well. Just in, in little, or not executive, excuse me, the continuing committee. Just little inferences like that are fascinating. So, of course, we also notice how there's going to be an open seat, and Koval and Kretek are both angling for it. And, of course, Sloan does a wonderful job of lying to Bashir by telling him things in a way that imply something that Bashir can then deduce from. It's pretty much the classic way. It's actually, I, I believe, a, a typical example of a Kansas City shuffle, which, in brief, relies on your target being smart rather than your target being stupid, and thus you present things in a way that they figure it out the wrong way. I love the white dress uniforms in this episode, by the way. I really do. It's an awesome thing. I, I love them in Insurrection. I love them here. I think these are the only times these are ever seen. I could be wrong about that. It's just a shame, because we never really get to use these things proper. I keep looking at my notes, excuse me, because there's so much to talk about here. Uh, Sloan, uh, there's this great bit where Bashir interacts with Koval and then Kretak. Now, what's amusing about that is both of them are interrogating each other for different reasons and in different ways. Bashir looks at Koval and then tries to kind of look him up and down and diagnose him medically. 
And you'll notice, by the way, that, that Sloane kind of pushed Bashir into this with the thought that Koval was someone he was trying to manipulate and influence and possibly kill, and from a medical tint, so you can kind of see how Sloane has basically helped to guarantee that Bashir will not be looking at him from a personality or psychological intent, and thus is much less likely to deduce that Koval is the agent. Koval, meanwhile, approaches him to play his role, and of course, straight up interrogate him. I must know about this virus, because that way, we have now planted the seed in Bashir's mind that Koval is interested in a horribly d d dominion-level virus. Let's just call it what it is. It's a new word for evil, dominion. A dominion-level virus that, you know, they, they can use for the Romulan cause or whatever. Meanwhile, then he goes and talks to Kretek, and he is much more polite and open and curious. He still interrogates her, but it's for the sake of personal curiosity and conversation, not for any agenda. And, of course, she interrogates him back for what is effectively the same reason, although her tint is a little more towards patriotism than cooperation. In short, he's doing it because he thinks they would make a good unit. You know what I mean. And she does it because she thinks the Romulans are a good unit. It's just fascinating seeing these little interplays and dynamics. Now... Sloan, of course, asks about accelerating the disease, and I was like, ah, never, never mind, never mind. So Bashir naturally logics his way through the fact that there must be a Romulan accomplice. Now, what I love most about the way that they manipulate Bashir in this episode is they do so almost entirely with presuming him to be intelligent and truth. Later on, Ross tells him we can't tell the Romulans that there's some kind of secret Section 31 planning assassinations. That, and, and he's right. They absolutely cannot do that. Yeah, so there's this secret Starfleet organization that we don't actually have control over, but they're planning to assassinate one of your people. FYI, at best, that shows the Federation as weak, incapable of controlling their own members, unstable, and dangerous. That will massively destabilize the Alliance. That's at best. It could go much further downhill from there. It could literally lead to a state of war. Like, out and out war between the Romulans and the Federation. So Ross is like, no, shuts it down. Now, <laughs> this then leads to probably my favorite moment of manipulation in the episode, because it's mostly for the audience's sake. It's when Bashir goes down and they, they talk randomly. Oh my god, Admiral Ross had an aneurysm. And then Bashir sees Sloan. Remember, Ross said, I'm going to order Sloan confined to quarters. And now Sloan is just out in the thing. It's like, hey, what's going on? So we automatically are like, oh my god, he did it. And again, relying on you being smart in order to put the pieces together. So Bashir does the only logical thing. He reaches out to Kretak. And he... I'm trying to think how to phrase this. This in many ways shows how politics is not Bashir's forte. Because he reaches out to her and asks her to, to perform treason, because it is legally treason, in order to try and inform him of something in order to try and save them. Now, she goes along with it because, again, this is something that she believes will be for the good of the Romulan Star Empire. She's a patriot. He does it because he thinks it's what's right. And that's okay. You know, moral moral standing, ethical standing. Kaval then... What happens shortly thereafter is fascinating. I haven't actually mentioned this before. John Fleck plays Kaval. He does a good job. He does an excellent job of the role. And he's, I actually like John Fleck, although he tends to play the more type 3 villain, you know. I mean, most people probably remember him as Silic over in Enterprise. But he's actually a good actor in general. He plays several roles over the years. Uh, he's kind of a Star Trek vet in his own right. And he plays the role perfectly because he comes across as someone who is just, yes, come here, Doctor, we're going to rip the information from your mind by whatever means necessary, and there's nothing you can do about it. He comes across as crisp, professional, with a bit of a sneer built in. The perfect Romulan, right? I actually wonder a lot what exactly Section 31 did to flip this guy. Or if he's Koval at all. As in the original Koval. Anyways, given Section 31's operations, I wouldn't be surprised if Koval has been a, one of their agents for uh, decades range, maybe. Long time, in short. Either way, he is willing to effectively rough up Bashir. Not straight up torture, just rough him up. Obviously the scanner doesn't work, which is interesting in its own right. So then they bring in 
uh, Sloane, who was willing to be roughed up and, you know, go through this whole song and dance, being dragged before them, etc. Well, these are not exactly high prices. I point this out because, once again, this goes back to something I've talked about many times. The only thing that determines how far you're willing to go is the price of what you're getting. In short, an, an, an operative or an infiltrator will do as much as they need to to maintain the infiltration so long as the value gained is sufficient to justify it. And in this case, yeah, Sloan was probably willing to actually die for this one if need be. And they were probably willing to kill Bashir for this too, despite the fact that Sloan doesn't want to die and none of them actually want to kill Bashir. I don't say that casually. This is a Federation... These are Federation personnel who do believe in the ideology of the Federation and, you know, are generally good guys in their own general mentality. And they're still willing to murder if necessary because of how valuable this is. Getting someone like Koval into the continuing committee and positioning him in such a way so that he is going to be ensuring Romulan cooperation for however long going forward? Yeah, that's worth a lot. <laughs> so Kretak is, of course gone. Probably dead. We never heard about her again. And then Bashir starts thinking about it. And anybody watching this episode is probably thinking the same thing. Funnily enough, Bashir's main point that really made him start thinking was that's not Sloane. Sloane's not some rogue operative who's out for revenge. Not the way I've seen him. Remember, we've seen him already. We, the audience, have too. So it's like, no. I do know a few people back in the day who wanted Section 31 to be fake because they didn't like Section 31. So I know a few people were kind of on board with it, but even they were like, nah, I didn't buy it. So we find out the big thing. And of course, he says it again, inter arma einem silent legis is how he pronounces it. I don't know. It's Latin, guys. What do you want from me? I'm not a Latin pronunciator. <laughs> but they go off the record. And they talk about it. And what I love most about this scene is it really shows one of the interesting dynamics of this kind of war. Because I've talked a lot throughout Season 6 about the, the, the recurring theme of the tangible versus the intangible. This is a far more complex theme. This is the intangible versus the intangible. While the war and the, the, the necessity of it and all that is the thing, this is about politics, about intelligence, about war and connection, about morality and about ethics. And oh, basically every one of those things is an intangible concept. I love how Bashir is so self-righteous here, and yet ultimately cannot actually come up with a valid argument other than principles. Whereas Ross ultimately cannot come up with a valid argument other than it was necessary, ends justifying the means. Both bounce off each other consistently throughout the course of the, the meeting and neither convinces the other, at all, of anything. I mentioned I'd come back to something. Uh, at the beginning of this, uh, I was looking into it, and I noticed that there was a quote by Ira Stephen Baird, who he didn't like this episode because he wanted Bashir to be compromised. He wanted Bashir to be guilty. He wanted Bashir to, 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 to come through this with his hands dirty. I disagree. <laughs> I know, shocking me disagreeing with Ira Stephen Baird. But I disagree because, for me, this isn't... Bashir's in the pale moonlight. This is Ross's. This is Admiral Ross accepting that he has to do something that he doesn't like, and he is not in favor of, and he doesn't agree with, in order to accomplish what he believes to be a greater good. And he goes through with it. We don't have the full denouement that we got with Cisco for obvious reasons, and I don't know which side of the line he stands on that one, but you can see why he makes the thing. And I quote, I don't like it, but I've spent last year, uh, the last year and a half of my life ordering young women and men to die. I like that a lot less. Now, what I like, so that's probably the closest thing to a real point either of them make. Bashir then counters, that's a glib argument that, that flies in the face of the fact of what those men and women are dying for. Probably the one real weakness of the episode for me is the fact that Bashir doesn't really have a strong argument on his side. He is very anti-this, the end. He doesn't seem to consider it. He doesn't debate it. He is firmly on the side of ethics, and that's the end of that. And I feel like that is one of the real weaknesses here, because if he could at least partially see Ross's side, because Ross can definitely partially see his side, 
we might see more of a dynamic between the two. Otherwise, it's just Bashir gets across as a little bit too preachy. Now, I know this is the arc he's been going through ever since... Uh, Statistical probabilities just keeps coming up. I know this is the arc he's been on for some time, so it still makes sense for him to go in this direction. I just think they could have, you know, made it a little less unilateral. Now, right at the end, <laughs> right at the end, Sloan reaches out to Bashir and gives him the speech. I actually save this here. Give me one moment because I wanted to share this with you. The Federation needs men like you, Doctor. Men of conscience, men of principle, men who can sleep at night. You are also the reason Section 31 exists. Someone has to protect men like you from a universe that doesn't share your sense of right and wrong. Now, maybe, now maybe this is just the severe cynicism and pragmatism of my nature, but yeah. As I said before, the Federation would not exist without ideology and pragmatism. And I've talked many times about the natural merger of being pragmatic and being ideal, or having an ideals, you know what I mean, about how those two things are both necessary for a greater whole, in my opinion. Sloan's right. Someone like Bashir is necessary for the Federation. If there were no Bashirs and only Sloans, the Federation would be horrible. It would be the mere universe. And if there were nothing but Bashirs, the Federation wouldn't be. So you can kind of see the point there. And again, this kind of is why I feel Bashir's Lack of proper counter-argument is part of the problem here. With one interesting exception, he goes to call for security and then he stops himself. Now, this is my big question of the episode for you. Why? Why does Bashir stop himself? It's the one thing they don't answer. I've only heard two real interpretations over the years, but I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts as well. Uh, one of the interpretations is he feels there's no point. He realizes Sloane's going to get away, Calling security, it's just going to be like him running out with the phaser early. He's not going to catch him. He's gone. The other interpretation is that Bashir realizes he has a point. And Bashir understands, and at least <sighs> grudgingly tolerates the point that Sloane makes. And thus just decides, never mind. What do you guys think? As ever, loved this episode, part one of ten. We get to the finale here, guys, right at the end of the year, too. I hope to see you for the rest of it next time.